Each year, many of us set out our nativity scene, carefully placing the baby Jesus between the parents in the story. We're representing the story that we think we know so well. In fact, the story has become so familiar to us that sometimes we miss the richness of the details. We gloss over Mary's call. We don't consider the parallel between Mary's call and our call on our lives. We don't learn what God is trying to tell us. And so today we're going to tell the story again. We're going to slow down and hear Mary's story afresh and consider what it tells us about our call and about God. The story begins in Nazareth, a little insignificant suburb of the more affluent Sepphoris. Families in Nazareth made their living as farmers or shepherds or as laborers serving in Sepphoris. It was a Severan-like village rather than a power center like Washington or a wealth center like Annapolis. This week in Bible study, we saw a video of the limestone caves that they called homes. They were nests of rooms carved out of the landscape. And they offered protection from the sweltering desert heat. They were safe, but very humble abodes. God chose an ordinary house in an ordinary town to begin changing the world. And God chose Mary. Biblical scholars say that she was only 12 or 13 years old. Young girls were sent to be engaged, sent to be married at the first signs of fertility, at the first signs of womanhood. Because the life expectancy in those days was only 35 years. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say that Mary was chosen because of her great virtues. She wasn't chosen because of her faithfulness or her cleverness or even her maternal instincts. In Bible study this week, Brian pointed out that possibly she was chosen just because she was engaged to Joseph. When we look at the beginning of the stories of Matthew, we see a genealogy showing Jesus' lineage. And, and it starts with Abraham, and then it, it works its way through to King David, and then it works its way through Joseph. So the connection to this miracle, the connection to uh, the divinic line in the house of Jacob is through Joseph. And Mary is his soon-to-be wife. So God's messenger arrives in the ordinary village, to tell an ordinary woman that she's going to give birth to an extraordinary son named Jesus. The name Jesus means God helps or God saves. The angel tells Mary that Jesus will be great, that he will be called the Son of the Most High, that he will reign and that his kingdom will have no end. And a perplexed Mary says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. That short little query brings into question more than the biology of the situation. In fact, how is Mary even going to survive this? According to the law, which you can look up, Deuteronomy 22, verse 23, an engaged woman who became pregnant by someone other than her fiancé was to be stoned to death. And even if her family and community believed her, I mean, do you think that her parents believed the God did it excuse? Even if her family believed her, if the word got out that she was pregnant with the next king of the Jews, the next person to... Um, receive the throne of David, then King Herod is going to be out to get her. We know in the coming stories that Herod removes this threat 
by killing all boys under two. Well, he would have killed Mary if he could have, if he had known about it before. And what about the religious leaders? They certainly would have condemned her for blasphemy if she went around telling people she was carrying the Son of God. If she gets past her fiancé's disbelief, if she works through her family's shame, if she's able to keep this pregnancy secret and the meaning of this pregnancy secret from the political powers and the religious powers, then she still has to contend with the birth itself. It's not uncommon for women in this age to die in childbirth. And so Mary asks, how can this be on her journey from that to let it be? There's no punctuation in the Gospels. The biblical interpreters and scholars add that punctuation so that we can make sense of the gospel for ourselves. But I don't think at this point Mary was like, yeah, right on, let it be. I think there was too many overwhelming negative outcomes right at this point for that to be herself, her own response. Artists often paint a very young Mary, quietly demurring to the power of the angel Gabriel. Sort of a, a Beatles, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be, whispering words of wisdom, let it be. She could have been resigned, submissive, assenting and letting go into God's will. But I think she was a woman of steel and answered it, let it be. When I was pregnant with my firstborn son, I was a computer programmer analyst, and I was contracted out to the Canadian Nas uh, Salvation Army. Now every day they took real lunch breaks and real tea breaks. <coughs> and so one afternoon, fairly in my third trimester, with my belly full swollen with a newborn coming, and my fingers swollen with no rings, belying the state that I was actually married, I was sitting in the cafeteria having a cup of tea. <coughs> And the good Christian folk would come to me, and they'd talk to me out of their concern, only to find out that I didn't need to be saved from a situation of shame. I was not a sweet unwed tea. I was there, fully educated, highly responsible, program in control of the whole of the Canadian Salvation Army system. I was a woman of steel. I just didn't look that way. Louise tells me she was 17 when she married. I hope I'm not revealing too much, but Amy, your mom tells me you were 19. Is that right? Both of these are women of steel who have walked with God through some of life's toughest challenges. In fact, take a moment and look at the woman beside you in the pew. Yep. Look at your mom, look at your daughter, look at your wife. She's most likely a woman of steel, no matter how sweet she looked when she was 12 or 13, she's a woman of steel who could say to God, let it be. God provides that strength. God steals men and women for the challenges that he's called to, and we can see this in the chat between Gabriel and Mary. When Gabriel greets Mary, part of that greeting is a declaration, God is with you. Mary wasn't in this alone. We are not in life alone. It may can feel that way at times, especially when we're trying to maintain control and do our own thing. But we are not alone. The Holy Spirit accompanies us all throughout our lives. 
The second piece of angelic advice was, do not be afraid you have found favor with God. God's hand is on this project. You have been chosen. You can do this. And yet, God had to come to Mary and seek Mary's yes. The same as God has to wait for our yes. We have that freedom of choice. Our yes is never forced. We are never tricked into a response of love. Biblical commentator Reverend Riker reminds us, that is the way it has been from the beginning. God would never allow people to continue in their own, God would even allow people to continue in their own disobedience to turn them over to their own ideas and let them make their own way, to get their own way and to find themselves in the prison of their own designs, to hit bottom if necessary, only if to give them a firm place from which to finally say, yes, okay, your will be done. God has a plan for us, but we have to say, Yes. The last part of Gabriel's message was, nothing is impossible with God. I looked that up in other translations. Sometimes it says, no word from God shall be devoid of power. Sometimes it says, for word of God will never fail. Or for there is nothing that God cannot do. Nothing is impossible for God. Sometimes we, we hesitate in our moment of yes, because when we see the plan, the obstacles look too huge. We don't think that we have the skills. We don't feel worthy. We don't think that we're good enough to take on this challenge. This type of negative thinking is whispered into our souls by the Lord of lies. God does work with ordinary people. We don't have to have special abilities for God to work miracles through the us. He just needs our availability and our commitment. So Mary, this woman of steel, says, here I am, let it be with me according to your will, your word. As we read on to the next section, we see that she, the next thing that she does is go and see her relative Elizabeth. God provides her with a mentor, an older, wiser woman who's already faced many challenges. Elizabeth is also a chosen one, someone who's already said yes to God, someone through whom God is making the impossible possible. Elizabeth, full of the Holy Spirit, shouts when she meets Mary. She says, blessed are you. Blessed is your baby. Blessed are you because you're a woman of faithfulness. It was an 80-mile trek over three mountain ranges for Mary to get to, from Nazareth to Ein Karim, where Elizabeth lived. That's a long time for a young girl to be left alone with her thoughts, to mull over her circumstances, to work out the what-ifs. And yet, all the fear, all her anxiety, all her doubts fall away after she talks to Elizabeth. Elizabeth doesn't change Mary's circumstances. She's still going to have to tell Joseph that she's pregnant and not with his child. She's still going to be threatened. Her child is still going to be threatened by political and religious powers. The path to fulfillment of God's plan is still going to require faithfulness and perseverance, but Elizabeth gives her hope. Elizabeth gives her encouragement. Elizabeth changes her perspective. A viewpoint of faith allows her to rejoice, to give thanks even in these circumstances. And Mary begins to sing a song of praise, a song that we, heard, we call the Magnificent, that we heard a bit of at the beginning. We heard Bach's interpretation, and then we read in our bulletins 
a prayer based on her song. Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She's completed the journey from how can that be to let it be. Joy is a choice that we make when we look at our circumstances with eyes of faith and believe that God is with us and that nothing is impossible with God. This month, our congregation, our little group of ordinary people in the ordinary town of Severin has said yes to a number of challenging God plans. We hope that the breakfast with Santa next week invites the children from our neighborhood into our church. Maybe it's the first time they've been to a church. It's giving them an opportunity to be introduced <coughs> to the family of God. And then next Sunday, we expect the Itzel's gift of music to touch the hearts of our family, friends, and acquaintances, introducing them, perhaps, to the presence of God. Also, on Christmas Eve, we really hope that we can make Mary's song a reality for our community. We want the hurt, and abused, or lonely, and lost children to be lifted up, to be healed and given a new, fresh start. And so we're giving away our Christmas Eve donations to the Child of Board Care, a United Methodist-sponsored social agency. These missions are going to require people to give up their time and energy. These missions are going to require us to move out of our comfort zones and invite friends who don't go to church to come and visit our ch church. These missions are going to require our church, our family here, to sacrifice some of the income that we would normally spend to heat to feed ourselves, to make the church go. We're going to spend that income. But we say, let it be. Let us be in mission in this way for our Lord. The Lord is with us, and we are blessed. Let it be. When you go home this afternoon, and you're relaxing with a warm cup of tea or coffee, pondering the crash and that little holy family in the manger. Think about Mary's response to God's call. Because miracles don't just happen. They are born through painful labors of love. And our lives matter when we give them away. Mary is not just a pawn in God's game. She accepted her call to sacrifice mission of motherhood. And so while you're reflecting and spending time listening to God, it will be a good thing because maybe God is waiting on your yes. Maybe God is waiting on your let it be. God could be waiting to bring a blessing into your life or for you to be a blessing in the lives of others. Amen.